Saigon. Shit. I'm still only in Saigon. <laughs> These are the top 10 films of 2011. When I say top, I mean my personal favourite films. There were so many great films that came out that year, so there's going to be loads I've missed out. So please do include your favourite films down below. Cheers. The top four films are all kind of depressing. So let's start this list on a lighter note. In a number 10, The Muppets. The Muppets return to the big screen with this charming movie. It had been 12 years since the last Muppet picture, and here we have three fans of the show on a quest to reunite the Muppets to save the Muppet Theatre from being demolished. All the Muppets get their time to shine, and it was genius casting to have the lovable Jason Segel and Amy Adams as the human characters, so that they don't get completely sidelined by the characterful puppets. Muppets have always been about artistic integrity, not cheap tricks. Check it out, fart shoes. <laughs> This is going to be a really short movie. But stealing the show is Brett McKenzie of The Flight of the Concords, who wrote the songs for the film, even winning an Oscar for the tremendously funny Man or Muppet. Very manly Muppet. I'm a Muppet in a In a number nine, George Harrison living in the material world. The master, Martin Scorsese, makes a three-and-a-half-hour documentary about the Beatle George Harrison. What's not to like? You can't help but love Scorsese's enthusiasm. And through his documentaries and concert movies, it's wonderful to see his passion for music. I love the Beatles and George Harrison, who was so much more than just a musician. He was also a great supporter of British cinema, with his company Handmade Films releasing some of my all-time favourite British movies, including The Life of Brian, Time Bandits, The Long Good Friday, and With Nail and I. A common question is who was the best Beatle? I love all of them, but in my mind when they were together, I think Paul, as he wrote so many of their biggest hits. While John was the most interesting and fascinating, George had my favourite post-Beatles career, and through this documentary you can't help but find Ringo the most charming and likeable Beatle. The last weeks of George's life, he was in Switzerland and I went to see him, and he was very ill, and he, you know, he could only lay down. And while he was being ill and I'd come to see him, I was going to uh, Boston, because my daughter had a brain tumor, and I said, well, you know, I've got to go, I've got to go to Boston, and he goes, <sighs> that's the last words I heard him say, actually, and he said, uh, do you want me to come with you? <laughs> and, oh, God. In a number eight, Midnight in Paris. Woody Allen's Paris set time travel comedy still leaves plenty of room for his favorite subject, adultery. Does that sound terrible? Owen Wilson plays Woody Allen, an awkward struggling screenwriter who is desperate for an affair. While on holiday with his materialistic wife in Paris, he finds a street while wandering around at night that transports him back to the 1920s. Here he meets all the famous writers and painters of the period, and also a woman he falls in love with. It's kind of goodnight sweetheart, but with a bigger budget. It's one of Alan's best of this century, and has one hell of a cast, including Rachel McAdams, Marion Cotillard, Kathy Bates, and Leia Sadu. Okay, but, but, no, no, what, 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 okay, I'm gonna get it and then I'll be back. In a number seven, Drive. Style. Nicholas Winding Refn loves two things, violence and posy beautiful shots. The balance between the two isn't always perfect, but in Drive he hits the right balance. Ryan Gosling plays a near silent getaway driver, a trope that's been used many times with mixed results. This driver keeps to himself, but after getting attached to his neighbour and her son, his life spirals out of control in an increasingly violent way. The two highlights of this film are its spectacular cinematography and its astonishing score and soundtrack. It looks and sounds amazing. Do you remember this? <gasps> no. In a number six, The Tree of Life. One of Terence Malick's best, 
just ignore the CGI dinosaurs. Much like Drive, the things that I truly love about this movie are its visuals and atmosphere. My lord does Malik like shots of trees and nature. This is amusing on the meaning of life. Sean Penn plays a man looking back at his childhood in 1950s Texas, a time where he lived with his loving mother and his short-tempered father, played by Brad Pitt. It's not a perfect film, and it drags in certain parts, but that doesn't matter, as it's made by a director with a clear vision. It's a delicate film about love and loss. Unless you love, your life will flash by. In a number five, The Raid. One of the best martial art movies of this century so far. Who would have thought a Welshman living in Indonesia would make such a good action movie? And it's the fighting and the action that is at the heart of this film. The plot is tremendously simple. A police squad is sent into a high-rise run by a crime lord, and they have to get to the top floor to get the bastard. The fight scenes are truly remarkable, with the Indonesian martial art Pencak Silat being used, which gives the scenes a real sense of hard-hitting brutality. I studied Pencak Silat for about two months at school. I was truly rubbish at it. Who isn't rubbish at it is its star, Iko Wise, who gives a brilliantly physical performance, showing off his skills, but at all times showing through his facial expressions that he is frightened and in danger. The raid is a hell of a ride. As I said before, these top four are remarkably depressing. In at number four, we need to talk about Kevin. Much like The Omen, this is a movie about a woman who gives birth to a monster, although this one all too real. Lynn Ramsey was the perfect person to direct this adaptation of Lionel Shriver's novel about a woman dealing with her psychopathic son who ends up committing a massacre at his school. It's a cold, frightening film. There is no hope from the very beginning, and it gets nastier and nastier. Tilda Swinton, for my money, gives her best performance as the struggling mother. She is an actor who sometimes loves to go over the top with false teeth and big accents. And everyone loved it. This is so disappointing. But here she gives such a subtle performance as the woman who very quickly on knows that there is something wrong with her son. Let's talk about the son. He is played by three actors who all give suitably frightening performances. And for most of the film, he is played by Ezra Miller, who is brilliant in the movie and has never really been that good again. The cinematography is great and Johnny Greenwood's score is excellent. This is by no means an easy watch, but it is a remarkable film. Oh. In a number three, A Separation. A stressful but riveting watch. Asghar Fahadi's drama is one of the most believable, involving movies of the 2010s. At the centre of the film is a married couple who is separating. The wife wants to take her daughter out of Iran, but the husband wants to stay because he needs to look after his father who is suffering with Alzheimer's, and so wants his daughter to remain as well. What is excellent is that we understand both of their positions entirely. Life is not easy, and this film shows that perfectly. Things get even more complicated when a pregnant woman who is hired to look after his father loses her baby after she is pushed while being accused of stealing. There isn't a bad performance in the picture. Every character is fully realised and there are no clear choices and no clear bad guys. The script is remarkable and the actors do wonders with it. By the end there are no real answers. The film leaves us with questions and that is perfect, for it stays with you. It's stressful, uncomfortable, and tremendously moving. In number two, Melancholia. Lars von Trier's film about depression and the end of the world. When you listen to the audio commentary, you hear that Lars von Trier is kind of disappointed that he had made the film too romantic. 
Well, that romantic feeling is the reason it's one of my favourite of his films. It's a film about the overwhelming nature of depression, and the use of Wagner's Tristan and Isolde is a wonderful juxtaposition to this. Kirsten Dunst has never been better as a woman struggling with her mental health. The one thing she isn't struggling with is the inevitability of death and the upcoming apocalypse. Equally good is Charlotte Gainsbourg as her sister, who can't accept this fate. Gainsbourg did not get nearly enough credit for her performance. She is astonishing in it. The first half at an awkward wedding is very uncomfortable to watch, and the second half about the end of the world is grand, sad and operatic. I watched this on a huge screen in the cinema, with only two other people in the theatre. It was a hell of a morning. And in a number one, Margaret. This film is certainly not for everyone. I'm not even sure it's for me. The director's cut, which is the cut to see, is over three hours long. It tells the story of a student who struggles to deal with the fact that she was partially responsible for the death of a woman after distracting a bus driver. Kenneth Lonergan makes films about subjects that I shouldn't be interested in. In You Can Count On Me, we had a brother and sister who are still struggling with the death of their parents. In Manchester by the Sea, we have a man with a tragic background being forced to look after his nephew when his brother dies. And in Margaret, a schoolgirl having a mental breakdown after suffering trauma. What on earth attracts Lonergan to these subjects? I don't like misery porn, but Lonergan makes films that are about real people, real relationships, and his films are so truthful that they are totally riveting and are always filled with great performances. And giving one of the greatest performances of the decade is Anna Paquin as the girl at the centre of the film. She is not just a victim. She is a remarkably difficult person who, while dealing with her guilt, causes chaos in the lives of those around her. She's weak, self-obsessed, and totally lost. The actors surrounding her are also fantastic, including Jay Smith Cameron as her mother, Jean Reno as a slightly dim man who takes a fancy to her mother, Mark Ruffalo as the driver ignoring what happened, and Matt Damon as a teacher Paquin has a crush on. All these characters are flawed and totally believable. The film was actually filmed in 2005, but 20th Century Fox did not want to release a three-hour small-time drama. And you kind of understand why. There were lawsuits and multiple edits, including an edit by Martin Scorsese and Thelma Schoonmaker. But it's Lonergan's three-hour cut, which you can only get on DVD, that shouldn't work, but really does. The time flies by as you spend time with these broken people. This is not for everyone. It's long and it's miserable, but it really worked for me. Right, so counting down my top 10. In a number 10, The Muppets. In a number nine, George Harrison, Living in the Material World. In a number eight, Midnight in Paris. In a number seven, Drive. In a number six, Tree of Life. In a number five, The Raid. In a number four, We Need to Talk About Kevin. In a number three, a separation, in a number two, Melancholia, and in a number one, Margaret. Well, those are my top 10 films of 2011. What have I missed out? Loads, probably. So please do include your favorite films down below. Cheers.